first, our journey in the cradle starts off in Maropeng where the community is benefiting from some of the world-class discoveries that have been made there. Marupeng, or returning to the place of origin as it translates from Setswana, is coined as the birthplace of humanity. It functions as the official visitor's centre for the cradle of humankind, which houses 13 geological dig sites. The most recognised of which is where the pre-human skull, known as Mrs. Pless, was discovered. The centre was built as a common point where all the geological activities in the area could be assessed from. In 1999, when the uh, World Heritage Site was declared by UNESCO, it was felt that there needed to be a central point that people would come to to get orientation of the cradle. The cradle is, is 43,000 hectares. and. So it's not just one destination, there are a lot of destinations. So the feeling was that we needed a focal point from which people can navigate. Entering the visitor's centre through this mound, which is called the Timulus, you'll have to take a short boat ride to the world-class exhibition that tells the story of human evolution. The boat ride in the dark is designed to make you feel like a paleontologist going in search of artifacts. At the end of the ride, you will discover a two and a half thousand meter squared site that houses fossils, large scale interactive educational displays, and interesting Stone Age artifacts. Although Marupeng is an interesting place for anyone interested in the evolution of humankind, the exhibition is geared towards students. Facilities to house school trips are being developed. You know, over the years, we've looked at Maripeng as a business and we've asked ourselves the question, how can we enhance it, how can we improve it? And uh, how can we make Maripeng, firstly, a destination where people will return to, and secondly, a destination that will uh, encourage people to come here? In the beginning we built Hominid House, which was students' accommodation in a dormitory style that can sleep 120 students. But at the time we built it, we didn't realize what the needs of the teachers were. So we're now adding um, a sort of a, a, an all-purpose hall and six single rooms for teachers that are accompanying the children, which will make it a much better uh, facility for schools. Catering to schools and education is only one part of the Marupeng business model. We've got uh, probably four uh, distinct markets. The one is the education department, uh, next is conferencing, then we've got the hotel and we've got uh, food and beverage. So uh, we market each one separately. Schools we market directly to the education department and the various uh, school publications that come out. We, we do barter deals with them. As far as uh, uh, the hotel is concerned, we've got an online booking system where people can get into the hotel and book online. Uh, the visitor center, as far as education is concerned, uh, we've, we've got an online booking system for the visitor centre and then conferencing we attend meetings like Meetings Africa and we have representation at Indaba, we have representation at World Travel Mart in uh, London and ITB in Berlin so we, we get out there and we get into people's faces in order to market the business and that's probably the most economical way of doing it. Although there are many facets to Marupeng, the concept is to market the cradle of humankind in its entirety to visitors. The idea is to make it a full day trip, yeah, rather than just come out and rush through the Marupeng uh, Visitor Centre, which you can do in an hour and a half if that's all the information you want. If you really want to get detailed information, it's a good four hour trip to Maripeng. Then there's the Stokefontein Caves, which is 10 kilometers away from us, where you can go into the caves, 
you can experience a cave within the cradle of humankind, see where Mrs. Pless uh, was found, see where Littlefoot was found, and uh, um, enjoy the environment. We, we're about to build picnic spots here at Marapeng so that people can then have a picnic afterwards and really have a family day out. There's also the Rhine and Lion, uh, the Rhino and Lion Park uh, in the cradle. There is uh, there's trout fishing facilities. There are so many things to do. No attraction would be complete without a curio shop for visitors to take some memorabilia home. But the Marupeng shop is unique because the curios here are locally made as part of a community initiative. It's a community beneficiary project in terms of craft production and craft development. The, the reason behind it was to say that we need uh, to find local crafters that are doing craft, but we need them to link their craft in terms of the area, the storyline within the area which talks to the evolution of mankind, but also the discoveries that are found within the area. So their craft, their craft uh, training was, was, was then customized to talk to that to that storyline of evolution. So we've got different kinds of, uh, of, the, of their products that they are doing that are linked, for example, the, the discover of Mrs. Pless. There are Mrs. Pless that are being done here from a smaller size to the bigger size. Even in terms of the ceramic, the embroidery, everything talks to the storyline of evolution. Being a UNESCO World Heritage Site requires the cradle to ensure that tourism growth benefits the local community. At the cleverly named The Hand That Rocks the Cradle, local residents produce replicas of the fossils for visitors to purchase. But their new skills are not just to ensure the shelves of the curio shop are stocked. The people that are here now, they are, we, we form them into, two, uh, into, into, into cooperatives. We've got five primary cooperatives. So as you see, we've got building, we've got molding, we've got ceramic, we've got printing. All those different uh, crafters, they've got their primary cooperatives, which is their uh, uh, funding generation model that they use. But they fit into our secondary cooperative, which is the Hells that rock the cradle, which is located at Maropeng, the shop that they do. So what they do, what the craft that they develop, they develop here, they sell it to the shop. So in bed, they, the money that comes, comes to them as primary cooperative, and they can share it amongst the members of each cooperative. The craft initiative is barely a year old, but already making the desired impact. With the Hands That Rock the Cradle, I think one of those, uh, the positive that we get from it uh, in terms of benefiting us is that we, we've got a very, um, we've got a, a market that is straight and forward to the tourists. We, we get a, a direct link to the tourists that we sell to them. And also um, the, the publicity that we get uh, in terms of, of, of it, uh, it benefits the company because people know about it and they come start um, come to, to our shops and start and start buying from us. To find out about the Hands That Rock the Cradle initiative, I sat down with Jane Zimmerman. Joining me now is Jane Zimmerman, the Executive Director of the Siazi Caesar Trust, who are the driving force behind the Hands That Rock the Cradle project. Jane, thank you so much for making the time to join us. Let's start off with the Hands That Rock the Cradle project. How did the project come about? Um, essentially, the Gauteng Tourism Authority um, called for bids mm -hmm. to develop crafters within the Cradle of Humankind area. Um, we submitted a bid and we won. And so what has been the Trust's involvement in the project? So really what we did was, um, given the brief from Gauteng Tourism Authority, which was really to involve crafters within the greater cradle of humankind area, which as you know is a big area, so I think it's about 56,000 hectares. Working with GTA it was to identify crafters mm. and potential crafters who would be interested in, in starting a business um, within the cradle that would use the cradle as an influence. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, to develop enterprise 
within the cradle that would benefit the very people who live within the cradle of humankind. Now I understand that skills are one of the most uh, strategic and perhaps one of your interventions that you bring into the Correct. community. Correct. What skills are being taught here? Okay, I think it's very important to recognize, which we've learned over many years, is that there are crafting skills and there are enterprise development skills and you very seldom find crafters who are marketers mm -hmm. or who can run this, what we would call the secondary entity which would serve the crafters themselves. So in terms, I'll start with the crafters. In terms of crafters themselves, it's often about product diversity, mm -hmm. uh, quality, uh, sourcing material. Obviously they need to have some basic business skills. They mm -hmm. need to understand the correct pricing of their product. Um, and also for their own financial records, they need to be able to understand if they're making a, a mm. profit at the end of a, any given month or year or whatever. Um, product diversity is essential and of course the Cradle offered a wonderful, unique opportunity to use the paleoanthropological um, situation in the Cradle as their inspiration. I mean it is a, a World Heritage Site and a very mm. unique place. The secondary people who will run the enterprise and serve the primary producers are different people, they're marketers, they're, they're people with a financial aptitude who could get out there after a mentoring period mm. and go to potential clients and market the products on behalf of the crafters. That is real enterprise development. It's no good us marketing them. Yeah. We're not developing enterprise. For it's real certainly people. a very interesting model, and no doubt I'm sure that you've perhaps seen this model in other places, having worked and maybe brought up uh, the results that you're looking for. Have you come across that? Well, interesting you say that because this is a new methodology we have recently adopted. So, in fact, the Cradle is our first project where we are implementing this model. We've been working in KZN and in Pumalanga for very many years, mm -hmm. and we've always acted as that middle entity, but we're not developing enterprise. We need to make those business opportunities available to the mm. very people that we're trying to mm. assist. And of course at a national level we've seen the Department of Arts and Culture coming through with that natural craft strategy. How do you see this impacting on the industry? Not sure, Nozipo. I was actually at a two-day conference last week with DEC. Um, and I'm fortunate to be one of the people who is assisting DAC to develop that strategy. Mm. So I think it's a little bit early days. We mm. all got homework to do that's going to take some time. Um, I'm not entirely sure. Let's see how we go. Are you optimistic though that uh, with all the work that it's likely to have the impact that it desires? I think the craft sector as a whole has huge, huge, huge potential. But I do think we need to take it to another level. Mm. Um, and I think we need to recognize that crafters cannot market their product and that mm. all craft development must start with the market. Well, one that s certainly seems that you've, you've been cracking quite well. Thank you so much uh, for making the time to sit with us today. Thank you. Of course, that was uh, Jane Zimmerman from the Siazi Caesar Trust.